I am maybe 12. And he comes up to me and he said, you're pretty good for a girl. Wait just a minute. I'm Rhonda Vincent, and this is my bluegrass story. We're playing a kind of a talent afternoon for Lee Mace's Ozark Opry. There was a group called the Wooten Brothers, and they played, and we played. The mandolin player of, of the Wooten family comes up to me, and he said, you're pretty good for a girl. I think he meant it as a compliment, but from that moment on, it was like, what do you mean I'm pretty good for a girl? I really took offense to that. He had no idea what he had inspired. That stayed with me all of my life since he said that. This is like my very first mandolin that I ever had. I started playing when I was eight years old, Green Top, Missouri. We are playing at a country music show and anybody who didn't play an instrument didn't get paid. I was just singing on the show. Dad said, here's the mandolin. He said, here's G, C, and D. And you're gonna be playing this every Saturday night for two and a half hours. And so after a while, I got tired of just the, you know, just the uh, three chords. And then we would have a, a jam at our house every night. There was a music party at the Vincent family every night. He would say, take it, Rhonda. And it's like, take it what I, I don't know so i started you know listening to albums slowing them down this is back when we had the large vinyl albums and i would slow it down to 16 and uh, was learning buck whites so i, I started uh, learning these and learning these licks so when dad said take it Rhonda," i would emulate one of these uh, solos that i had learned i think it signifies uh, my beginnings and that legacy of my family Bluegrass is in my heart because it was so ingrained in what we do and what we did. I was listening to uh, Bill Monroe before, you know, in my mother's womb. We were listening to Bluegrass. They were playing the music from playing all the time, my dad picking me up from school every day. We played till dinner, after dinner, friends came over. We played till bedtime. And this was just a, I mean, it was just an everyday occurrence. So bluegrass is in every element of my being, I would say.
Well, I wanted to do my first solo project. I'm still playing with my family. I mean, this is well into my, my 30s, which is probably unheard of. Luckily, I ended up putting my own band together. My father did not take that well. He said, I can only have the family as my band. So that was, that was really a rough patch and a, a very hard uh, thing for him because he had raised me up to that point. Luckily, we had a festival once a year. So we had this reunion and we still did a few shows. So it wasn't like we weren't ever together again. As I talk to other people who, who've never been to festivals before, um, they don't really understand a lot of it. I love it because it is so natural for me. I mean, there's nothing like going to a bluegrass festival. I'm thrilled that I work with a band that share that same love. It's like we go play, you know, we might play the Grand Ole Opry. We just might play the Ryman Auditorium, Performing Arts Centers, beautiful places. We played in Prague at this one of the historic locations. But there is nothing like pulling up to a festival. You hear the banjos ringing, there's jam sessions, the stage shows going on. People are hustling and bustling, taking their lawn chairs and getting ready to hear the show. I was in the Wall Street Journal. So people, men in suits, start coming to the shows and to the festivals. And I remember there's a couple out in, that live in Washington, DC. And she texts me afterwards and she goes, we will not be attending any more of your shows that do not have flush toilets. So that's something that we grew up just automatic. It's like, it's not a big deal for us, but for someone who's never been to one before, that could be a big deal, I guess. But there's just a joy, a complete joy that my band and I, we are all unified in this wonderful love of the festival. Well, this was song of the year for us in 2004. She pulled out a mobile. And all points in between Found it, found a rhythm Making up lost time Heading for that bluegrass state of mind White smoke rolling Whistle blowing Listen to her engine Keep on time In the keep on line
I think the reason I'm in bluegrass music, I did the two country albums. That was like my musical college years. They tried like a hundred shades of blush on my cheek. They, I learned about imaging. They said, you are wearing three sizes too big on your clothes. There was a wonderful time of learning about the business part of that. But it was at that point I came home and I said, what am I gonna do with my life? It's like, I just did this later, I think, instead of when you're coming out of high school to choose what you're gonna do. The, here I am later on, I, that was my college years, and I put, to, put my first band together. You know, it's Rhonda, Allen, Joey, and Earl. That's how we got the rage. Well, we did a few festivals. That seemed too easy, playing these festivals, but I found I, I was never happier. It's like, this is so fun, and this is, it's like, but this wouldn't be my career because it's, I'm happy and it's too easy, right? Because that's what I love. I love doing this. And it's just like, then all of a sudden, I signed with Rounder Records. I signed with an agency. And it's like being in the right place at the right time. With my first Rounder album in January of 2000, two things that are pivotal. Uh, the Wall Street Journal wrote a wonderful review of the album. They said, Rhonda Vincent, the new queen of bluegrass. It's like, wow. Didn't even know that they review music in the Wall Street Journal. And then I signed a sponsorship with Martha White. And finally, for the first time in my life, I'm at the right place at the right time. I won my very first, uh, first of seven consecutive, I guess, now eight, uh, the IBMA Female Vocalist of the Year. So it was never this instantaneous, I'm this. So this is so natural. It, I was confused by it, actually. And it wasn't until a few years ago that I said, so this is what I'm going to do with my life. I seriously, I mean, it was 10 years. It was 15 years into the rage that I finally said, wow, OK, this is what I'm going to do. And I love every second of it. I brought a song that I wrote about my life with friends and family. It's an autobiography about my playing music and growing up uh, you know, in a musical family and continuing to travel with friends. And uh, it's called All American Bluegrass Girl. Each day I greet the morning with the sounds of the radio. Lester Flatt was singing on that Martha White show. Big K on the banjo and Marty on the mandolin. I'm an all-American bluegrass girl and proud of where I've been. Bill might be from Kentucky, should be from Tennessee. Though I might be from Missouri. I was thinking about how how awesome it was that I'm in the Bluegrass Music Hall of Fame and, and Museum, and I'm singing about Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs 
and Jimmy Martin and Bill Monroe and Martha White and the wonderful correlation that it is that we, while we're here. The Bluegrass Music Hall of Fame and Museum, located in beautiful Owensboro, Kentucky. When the photographer finished with the shoot and he called me, he goes, I've got the shot. And he said, I'm going to send it to you. He sends it to me and I'm like, are you kidding me? I knew it was going to be titled All American Bluegrass Girl. So I brought red, white, and blue to wear. And the stylist went to the bus and looked and found this green, this lime green dress. And she says, I want you to put this on and I want you to put it on with gold boots. I'm thinking, this is the oddest combination I've ever seen. The title is All American Bluegrass Girl. It needs to be red, white, and blue. But I humored her. I put this green dress. It had fringe. Um, it had, I put these gold boots on. And I did this pose that they told me to do, uh, sitting ironically, but it was a lime green wall. It was in the entrance of a men's bathroom. I'm not sure where we go. I like greet each day and see what's the next opportunity since being inducted into the Grand Ole Opry. Most recently, I've sang on a song with Dolly that's going to be in a movie, uh, a duet with Josh Turner, a duet with a mainstream artist by the name of Cody Johnson. Like a couple of days ago, I get a phone call from Gene Watson, and we, you know, we done a couple of country albums, one with Gene Watson and one with Daryl Singletary. And Gene says, hey, would you sing another duet with me? And it's like, of course. Well, my father would be so proud, especially the pivotal moment of becoming a member of the Grand Ole Opry. That was a lifelong dream for him, you know, let alone seeing his children. And I mean, I'm getting, I'm getting chills because Darren and I, to hold separate Opry memberships, it's historical. It's the first time a brother and a sister have held separate memberships. So there's just so many things that I know, you know, he would just love this so much. It's an amazing thing to look back and say, because I'm not one to like, I did this, I did this. It's like, I'm still living this. So what can we do next? When you start thinking about it, it's, it's pretty amazing. And I'm, I'm, I just thank the Lord, I'm so thankful.